Shalom. This is Ras Alonso Tafare uh, reporting for the Land of Judah Society. It's on Tuesday, July 26, 2016. It's 3.36 a.m. Now, we can, you know, we can try to bring this forth and just stick to the program. You know, um, so let's see. Let's begin with the book of Numbers. There's a couple of numerations that we'd like to bring forth. One apparently took place in the wilderness of Sinai. Let's see, a reference to this would be the book of Numbers, chapter 26, verse 64. But among these, there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron, the priests, numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. Fine, that's that. There is a, a second numeration the which um, uh, we learn about. It's also in the book of Numbers. Reference is chapter 26, verse 63. <laughs> to my surprise, I was, I was trying to look for it in another, in another place. Anyways, it reads, These are they that were numbered by Moses and Eleazar, not by Moses and Aaron. These were numbered by Moses and Eleazar, the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. That's a second numeration. Fine. What is it that we're trying to bring forth? I forgot, actually. Um, oh, I think this is about um, the Kenizzites. Ethiopia, really. Anyways, now. Numbers chapter 32. Verse my bad, I kind of skipped something. Caleb and Joshua, which is the theme, uh, the principal theme. Numbers chapter 26, verse 65. To my surprise, this is right next to, I mean, I've had these three verses like right next to each other and not even aware of it. So it says, <laughs> um, is that correct? Yeah, I think it is. Oh, 65, I'm back. So it reads, and for the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So, let us go forward. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to even add any commentary. I just want to get this over with. Um, it's kind of late, <laughs> or early, for that matter. The Book of Numbers, chapter 32, verse 11 to 12. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob because they have not wholly followed me save Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite and Joshua the son of Nun for they have wholly Followed the Lord. I think it's only proper to bring forth that you know tied into this is is both rods, you know the rod of Ephraim, and the rod of Judah. You know, I'm tempted to do something. I'm tempted to just say something. You know what the connection is. It's in, in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, towards the end. There's a hidden throne right there. There's a hidden throne in the last verse, the which is not translated in the English, but it is in the Amharic and it is in the Spanish. But there's something interesting about about that um, section. And, and it, you know, like, it just, it just, you know, it, it, it kind of like, um, it gets my attention. What could I say? Watch, this is what we... We would like to say concerning that. You've seen that picture where, you know, um, Mariam, you know, he's got Jesus, Jesus as a child upon her lap. That's, that's, imagine that. You know when, when um, Moses is on the top of the hill, Joshua and his elect are fighting the Amalekites in the valley. And then on top of the hill is Moses stretching forth his arms like Ethiopia 
Psalm 68, verse 31, if I'm not mistaken, stretching forth her arms um, with the branch in his arm or with the rod. You know that it's a sign of the rod because he did say, I go up with the rod of God up to the mount or to the top of the hill. But how could he be holding the rod if his hands are stretched forth? And then he's got Hur representing the, the tribe of Judah to one side. And he's got Aaron representing the Levites on the other side. How could that be? If it, well, there's a hidden rod even. There's a, there's a missing link and it's not Lucy. You know? So, but it is Ethiopia. It does have to do with the, Ethiopia. So, he's on a rock. So, he's, he's sitting on a foundation. On this foundation has the Lord sworn that his throne shall be because of the burden, because of because of the nature of man, we could say. In this order of battle, shall we war against Amalekites, you know, from generation to generation. So there's, there's, there's some hidden elements concerning that. But upon that foundation, the throne will be laid that until you receive in the heavens clarification, then you will be able to see manifested on the earth. But you're not able to see what's the throne that's always been on earth. Because your heaven is distorted. Because you're wicked. You just don't want to accept what is. Because it's not any kind of problem but a God problem. You just don't want to accept that he is true and faithful. And that his word is fulfilled. Because then we can't pick and choose to our liking. And our own benefit. So that makes it too real. It makes it too true. It makes it too, too, too much like something we don't want to have to do with. Because we like it in Egypt. It's a very comfortable. You know, so now, uh, what are we trying to look for? I'm trying to look for this psalm. There's something interesting in, in the Amharic concerning uh, that which we were just uh, mentioning. I can't find it. For some reason, it was right here the whole time. My bad. So, Chani is, is used, and it's... It's referring to the load, burden. And the interesting is thing is that chena or chena, it means lap or thigh. There's really no major difference between chana and chena. Yeah. Aside from the vocalization of the vowel accompanying the consonant, which form a father-son um, covenant within each, you know, symbol representation in, in the, in the Afro-Semitic, um, Afro-Semitic, uh, uh, you know, like, um, Amarnya, uh, or language, you know, speech, which is interesting, Chane, Chane, lap or thigh or load. So what I'm trying to say is that upon the lap of Moses, is the spirit, is the son that is to be born of that woman. Because Moses is not Moses. You see, Moses is the soul. Ethiopia stretching forth her hands is the body, is the woman. And the burden is a light thing. Even a light child. It's a light savior. <laughs> Reminds us of this, um, you know, uh, in, anyways, uh, of this video war with the land of Judah. Anyways, so Moses has, it's a picture of like, of everything. Without Ethiopia stretching forth their hand, if you don't accept the woman that bring forth that man child, and that woman is the body of Moses, except there's a veil, so we can't see that. That's why Joshua and his elect are fighting in the valley, while, while we all connected, Aaron, the priesthood, one, one half of the blessing, and then of, of the birthright, and then who tribe of Judah on the other side, but in the center, it's Moses, the called savior, and he's carrying a burden, but then also Chane, Chane, load, and Chane, Chane, and Chen, it, it's, you know, if we want to just, you know, play with the words, it's like lap or thigh, what's in his lap or thigh? His child, because Moses is not Moses, Moses is the soul, his body, which is, which would be what's represented is Ethiopia, because he married Zipporah, the Ethiopian, and so that that in itself is very interesting. So we're gonna go forth to you know to the planned curriculum that we had set forth. Now, 
Why did I say that? Because it has everything to do with this. Caleb and Joshua, these two are, are representations of Ephraim and and um and uh and Judah. Now where does the, the priest the Levitical priesthood come in? How, how why is it not represented in the rods? Well, because the priesthood was only like a intermission work, a inter uh, intermediatory work, like a like a let's buy time, job buying time until the, the Ethiopian work was perfected, until it was fulfilled. That's all it was. It, it wasn't supposed to be to the tribe of the the priesthood was not supposed to stay, you know, within the confines of um the tribe of the Levites. It was only a, a you know just a a moment in time until until the work was was made manifest. That's what that is. So it wasn't never supposed to like last forever. It was um just for 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 the time being. Until you know the promise reached to whom it it, it was given. Going forward, this is how we're gonna connect everything. Watch. Um, Book of Numbers, chapter twenty-six, verse sixty-five. Did we read that already? I think we read that already. All right, let's go forward. Chapter. Uh, we read the next thing we have here in our notes. So these two witnesses are the same two witnesses that that originally came out of Egypt that were twenty years and older, Caleb and Joshua. So now let us go forward to the book of Numbers. We're still in the book of Numbers, chapter 34. Check this out. Chapter 34, verse 17 to 19, the which read, These are the names of the men which shall divide the land to you, Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun. And ye shall take one prince of every tribe to divide the land by inheritance. And the names of the men are these, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Keep that in consideration. It's very, very, very significant. Having said that, let us go forward to um to the book of, uh, still within the book of Numbers, chapter 13. Chapter 13, verses... 11 to to um 11 to 11 to 12 of the tribe of Joseph namely the tribe of Manassas wait 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 what am I doing did I write this wrong let's see the book of numbers I'm obviously a little bit sleepy I excuse myself for that, but there's no excuse. The book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 8. Of the tribe of Ephraim, Osea, the son of Nun. Now we're going to go forward to, um, let's see, verse 16, to clarify that a little bit. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Osea, the son of Nun. Yehoshua, later on, you know, mentioned as Joshua. So, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, is prince, you know, of the tribe of Judah. Um, Joshua, Yehoshua, once Oshea, before, you know, Moses changed his name. He is son of um, Nun, of the tribe of Ephraim. Let's go forward to uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 41. We could just summarize all this, but then we would actually take longer, to be honest. Because we'd go on talking and talking and talking. And what we want to do is just bring forth this evidence to which it has to be recognized. Chapter 41, book of Genesis verse 45 to 50 or or verse 45 and 50 Joseph rejected by his brethren receives a Gentile bride a body in this case an Egyptian body 
and Pharaoh called Joseph's name um, Zafnat Panea, and he gave him to wife Asnat, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Now verse 50 would be in Joseph, and to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bare to him. You know, Manasseh and Ephraim. Man, there's so many things that, that must be said about this. Uh, you know, you know what the, you know what Zafnath Panea means in, in um in the like the Egyptians they used to say that that the savior of the world you know what it says well the note here says in the Coptic but in the Hebrew it's the revealer of the revealer of secrets this should give us an idea of the kind of attitude we should not have so the Egyptians say you know that Zafnat Panea it's like, oh, Joseph, the, the savior of the world. Cool. But, the but you know, the attitude amongst the Hebrews is like, is like oh, you know, the teller of secrets. The ones, the one that tells the, the animals or the normal people the, the, the things that make us special. That kind of attitude is what got us into the situation we're in, for the record. Peter, thou shalt not call any any man unclean stop calling people animals stop, stop considering other people flocks because then you're going to be treated like a flock think about it something to think about it. and I'm, I'm not playing you know both jew and gentile greek and i mean greek and jew have proven to govern for themselves and and both have proven to be as wicked as ones could be, one towards the other, even amongst oneself. So that's part of the lesson that we must learn. No one's better. No one. Going forward, it's interesting because the priesthood is actually a worldly thing. Do you think it's any surprise that Joseph married the daughter, Asenat, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Why? Because priestly rites are a thing of a firstborn. They cannot be changed. They cannot be updated. The number is sealed. It is always intact. Nor, no less, no more. That is why the firstborn, in order for there to be a birthright allotted to the children of Israel, then the firstborns that have received that birthright by birth in the natural sense must die to make space for that blessing to be um, laid upon those who have, who are the, the recipients, which are in turn the replacement to those that have sacrificed their lives in order to give up that birthright. So the reason why Joseph marries the daughter of Asenath is to gain a legitimate priesthood through through. The priest of On, Potiphar's daughter, then Joseph's inheritance, which he then transfers onto Yaakov by the will of the Almighty, then that becomes the legitimate priesthood, the right of a priesthood. Because the priesthood was not limited to Israel prior to Israel. Israel is just a new thing. Before Israel, every firstborn male of every family was endowed with the first with the birthright, and then it was limited to Shem, and then it was limited to Abraham, and then it was limited to. So we see the pattern here, but it's no surprise that it just so happens that Moses marries the daughter of Jethro, priest of Midian. You see the connection. So now, going forward. Let's see what we got here in our notes. Uh, Genesis um, chapter 48. That's going to talk about how, you know, Jah promised certain things to Yaakov. And well, behold, through Ephraim, uh, it all is fulfilled. And now, just to add to this, I've said before, split and flip, you know, divide the hoof or split the hoof and then um, chew the cud. That rule applies. This is one example. Who is the firstborn? 
son of Joseph. Uh, flipped script, or script flipped. It's not Joseph's son. Hey, Joseph, guess what? Through your children, they're actually mine like Ruben and Shimon. And through my children, uh, Jas' promise is fulfilled to me. So whatever you have after that, that's yours. You know. Um, so the script has been flipped. Or it's a flip scripter, but in, in, in the clean way. And now, okay, let me bless my children. So, you know, he brings forth the children. No, what are you doing? You put you, you can't bless um, Ephraim. You got the wrong one. Manasseh is the firstborn. I know. But now I'm a, now I'm a, what's it called? Now, I'm a divide the work. Now I'm a flip it. Or flip it and divide it. You know, I'm like, I didn't think about how to set that in order. But there's a flip. There's a twist to the matter. You know, there's a division and then there's a, well, it's divided. You're no longer, they're no longer your children, they're mine. So that's a division. They're circumcised um, to be mine. And then, well, the firstborn is not going to be the firstborn. The firstborn will be the secondborn. And the secondborn, I will bless with the firstborn, right? It's for it to be a clean work, you know, chew the cut. I mean, split the hoof and chew the cut, split and flip. So we see this throughout the whole Bible. Anyways. Just utilizing the opportunity to bring forth that that um, that example, so that uh, ones could understand a little bit better what what we were talking about when we mentioned that. Now going forward, this is where we're going to include the Kenizzites, uh, which in turn, in reality, at one point in time, they should be recognized as 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 Ethiopians refined. Well, Ethiopian perhaps is a refined Kenizzite. A possession, a possession the which we have acquired, the which has been converted and eventually assimilated to the point where they are no different than than a full-born, you know, Israelite. Now, to get to that, we're gonna well actually, before we we gotta just make a brief mention of the fact that notice how the Ephraim is the rod. Is one of the the birthrights is half of the birthright of Jacob, through the which he you know he will reign like all nations and stuff like that. So that means that he's a convert in a way. That means that he's half because his mom's Egyptian, and his father is spiritual. It's Israel. So what's going on? You know the rod has already gone to a people that is a mixed people. A mix between Ham and Shem. So now. And that is. You know concerning. Joshua because his father is known. Of the tribe of Ephraim. According to what we read earlier. So now let us learn a little bit more about Caleb. See that whole story. The book of Joshua. Is it Joshua? Yeah. No. Yeah the book of Joshua. Chapter 14. Verse 6. Let's see, let's see. Which reads, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Now you can skip a few verses. Go forward on to verse 13. And Joshua blessed him and gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjat Arba. Which, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Now let us let us um, just go forward onto the same book of um, Joshua, chapter fifteen, verse thirteen. And to Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord. To Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. 
And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, and Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Debir. And the name of Debir before was Kerjat Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjat Sefer, and taketh it to him, I will give Achas, Achzach, my daughter, to what? And Othniel, which means the line of God, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, interesting, right? Took it and gave him Achsa, his daughter, to what? And it came to pass, as she came to him, that, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said to her, What would is thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land, the queen of the south, perhaps. Give me also springs of water, Leitana, and the nether springs, the valley, upper and lower, upper and lower Ethiopia. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. So, appointed apart, or allotted apart, amongst the, the tribal children of Judah then is the Canaanites. Now, what, what does that have to do with Ethiopia? Let us keep reading. Book of Judges. Chapter 1. Verse 12 to 20. Let's see. And Caleb said, he that smiteth Kerjat Sefer, and taketh it, to him will I give Achsa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Achsa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass, when she came to him, that she moved, that, that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said to her, what wilt thou? And she said to him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Oh, that's where we get the fullness of that, the lower and upper Ethiopia, um, or Egypt. And the children of the Kenite, Moses. Man, this is confusing now. See, I knew it. The children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness. Man, there's definitely got to be. So, anyways, it doesn't matter because, like we've read before, in the book of Genesis, chapter 15, verse, verse Psalm 19, it says that the Kenites and the Kenizzites shall be given as a possession to Abraham, or to Abraham at that time. So, basically, what we see in here is that the consummation, or the consuming, the swallowing up of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the, the Kenites and the Kenizzites, through Ethiopia and so it's like a refinement of these Ethiopians and and converting them little by little until like Caleb's brother eventually marries what his his um his sister or what is it you know like kind of like it's more than just like what it appears to be these are kind of just you know lawful ways of, of writing these things down but basically it's like the merging of Ethiopia that never parted from from um, the tribes of Israel to the point where they're no longer Kenites or Kenizzites, but full-blown um, uh, Hebrew Israelites. Although, it, it, because you know, it's like a soul finding a body. It's the same thing. They 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 mesh. They link. It's it's it works out. It's what it is. It's what's supposed to happen. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palms with the children of Judah to the wilderness of Judah which lie in the south of Arat. So now we're going to we're going to go forward on to let's see. Um Judges chapter 4 verse 11. Now Heber the Kenite which was of the children of Hobab the father-in-law of Moses had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent to the plain 
of Za'anaim, which is by Kadesh. Perhaps, you know, there will be a link to Kadesh Barna. But it's very important to see what's going on right here. Heber is a Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Moses' father-in-law did, did not have no male offspring. That's why he had seven daughters. And the queen of, of Sheba was the one that would take care of, of um, Jethro's flock. And so when an Egyptian that came out, a prince, an Egyptian prince which came out of Egypt, when um, Zipporah made this known to Jethro, the priest of Midian, Jethro was like, why didn't you, why isn't he here? Go look for him. Why, why didn't you call him? Call him so that we can break bread, so that we could study Torah. Don't you know that it, I don't have male lineage? Otherwise, you wouldn't be out there. It is not proper for you to take care of my flock, but I have no sons. Bring them so I can give them to you. Anyways, so that's what eventually happens. Hobab is, is, is it's a, it's a code word. Hobab it means like, uh, like cover darkness, like in the heart. Um, Hobab, you know, I, I'd have to look that up again, but that's what it means, like secret. It's like in his heart. So what was in the heart? His children, the same children he had in his lap when he was on Mount, on that Mount, you know, representing the fact that he's the soul and Ethiopia stretching forth their hands to God, connecting the two rods, the two, making them into one through the child that is born, Lich Tefer, in the spirit, you know, Yeshua is, is, is with his chosen in the valley, you know, fighting the, the, the Amalekites. So what child is that? Well, you know, uh, symbolically at that point where on top of the rock, which Ethiopia was sat, which is in turn the body of Moses, which is alluded to in th this is Yahweh's banner, Yehovah Nesi. This is the, the banner, the pole, the sign, this sign, the, my throne. I, I swear on my own self that on, on this foundation will I lay my throne. So the child, symbolically at that time, is his children, the children of Moses with, with Zipporah, which he loved, but he had to let go of because he had other responsibilities. Thus, what do you do? You sign a bill of divorce and you hand over your children to Jethro. So now Jethro can be considered Chobab, the father-in-law of Moses. But his name is not Chobab. His name is many different titles. He's Raquel or Reuel, which is the friend of Jah, which is a title that he received from Abraham, his grand grand grandfather. Why? Because Abraham married his body, Ketura, that's Ethiopian the flesh. Sarah is a representation of the spirit, of the promise. Sarah's not so yes, she was black. I'm not gonna argue that. But that's not the way that ones are supposed to receive it. The, the child that Sarah brought forth was of the spirit. That's the, I mean, it's got to be represented like in a, in, a, in a physical form so that we can have a shadow of things to come. But the fullness of it is in spirit and in truth. Are we not spirit and are we not in the flesh? So if we called to the spirit and we inhabit flesh, then doesn't that make us seed of the flesh and the spirit? Yes, it does. So that is how... We supposed to look at it. Keturah is actually Abraham's wife in the flesh. Sarah is her his promise. Howbeit the natural things come at first, but the story lays down um, the spiritual matter concerning that, or relative to what we talk about Abraham and, or Abraham and Sarah, you know. So um, so that's that the connection. Um, through Keturah, Abraham had natural seed, which are you know in turn you know where where um. The Midianites come from. Now, ones might think, okay, we in the study portions, Balak and um and you know Finchas. Well, w what do we do about the Midianites and and how come they corrupt? How come they warring against Israel? Well, okay, Book of Genesis chapter thirty six. The Midianites were smitten, so the Midianites were under persecution. They too were downpressed. They were colonized, and so things happen. Jethro is is priest of Midian. He didn't lose his land because he could think for himself a way to serve Jah. Just like the Egyptians, they all lost everything. Everyone gave everything up to Pharaoh except the priest. Because they can feed themselves, they can sustain. They know that the famine has nothing to do with physical food. That's why they're not going to sell their possessions. 
like if selling, you know, like if trying to buy crack. Even Israel, you know, they got food, they ate it all, and then they came back for more, and they had to sell themselves as slaves because they wanted to restore. Well, in that case, because, you know, just set it all up, but, but in a case to avoid falling into Egypt again, we have to realize that you cannot satisfy a spiritual necessity through natural resources. So you're in the promised land and you're hungry. No, you're not hungry. There's not a famine. You're just being greedy. You got to overcome it. And, and you got to train yourself to understand that you cannot depend on physical or material resources whether it be food or whatever because those things you know go in one way come out the other way then you hungry again and what you're gonna keep doing that until you lose it all no so sacrifices must be made and then we will grow we go down into Egypt you know we enslave ourselves or we you know we we carry the burden of the tragedy of our time which could you know appear to be riches like Hagar oh look at this maid that I got in Egypt well Along with your with your lack of faith, now you're going to doubt and you're going to have an opportunity to actually manifest your doubt. So, hey, you know, Abraham, this is Sarai speaking. You know, Jai ain't really that powerful. Maybe what he meant was that maybe through my handmaid uh, we'll have descendants. Because, yeah, we went down into Egypt being spiritual and stuff. So we descended down to the valley. Now we're rich in the world. You know, because they gave us all kinds of things to remove the plague that we caused upon them, which doesn't make you any friends, but rather enemies to which our descendants somewhere along the line in the future will have to deal with because of the wrong that we brought upon the valley dwellers. We being spiritual and all, you know, expected to know best. We did worse. And so now job plagued them. And so we still blessed. So they definitely going to hate on us. But now that I got Hagar, why don't you go into Hagar? Uh, maybe that because God, yeah, we don't trust him, you know, so and he's not that powerful. So why don't you go into her and maybe that's the way we'll get seed. What happens now you got to put up with Hagar until she's old, until, you know, Ishmael. Then you got to put up with Ishmael and then you created for yourself a world of enemies. Going forward. Forgot where I was going with that. Kenesites, Kenesites, uh, Jethro, Midianites. Well, all right, let's just go forward. So anyways, Numbers, what does this say? Chapter 116, that don't sound right. This does not sound right at all. Now I'm going to be, why would it say? Let's see, okay, my bad, let's see. Oh boy, I wrote a note down here that I really do not understand. I know it's not the book of Numbers, chapter 1. I haven't gone to that scripture for a long time. Oh boy. Anyways. Yeah, that's definitely going to leave me with a doubt. Anyways, well, what could I do? Yeah, just <laughs> forgive us for that. I'm thinking that, you know, I kind of just stopped. Um, doesn't throw me off, but I'm going to be like in doubt as to what that even meant. Oh well, be it as it is, l let's go to, to, um, it's like I'm beginning to remember, but no, I'm not. Okay, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, 34, verse 3. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter, um, what did I say, 34, verse 3. And this is what it reads. Actually, yeah. And, um, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, to the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, to Zohar. Why did I read this? And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to, to the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord shewed him all the land of Gilead to Dan, and all of Naphtali and Ephraim, and, okay, to the land of Judah to the uttermost, and to the south, the plain of the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees, 
Well, because we just read that they, they went along with them. You know, the Kenizzites, I think, or the Kenites, went along with them from that point on. And there is a point, see, that's what, that's what messed us up. That's why we were kind of disappointed that we didn't recognize that, that we recognized we made a mistake in our notes. Anyways, well, be that as it may, there was a connection to be brought forth concerning that. But nonetheless, let's go forward to the book of Numbers, chapter chapter 10, verse 11. The witch reads, um, And it came to pass, is this it? Yeah, and it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month, in the second year, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle, the testimony. See, even this is, this is wrong. I don't know what's going on. I must be really sleepy. Uh, maybe it was because I was trying to say that they that they marched forward from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh was where they, the Kenites separated, but not all of them. It doesn't mean that all of them separated. It means that that Heber separated, and we know what happened. It wasn't a separation of like, oh, apostasy or whatever. Now it has been since 1974, but it was a salvation plan in the sense that then Jael, you know, she, she, um, you know, she hammered a nail through, through Sisera's temple, you know, blessed above all tents, all women. I think that's what, what, um, Deborah sang concerning Jael. You know, and that blessing. So the woman, the woman smites the serpent. I mean, same thing. You know, overcomes the dragon. And brings forth the man-child that is to, you know, uh, be caught up to Jah's throne. The throne of David. And uh, rule all nations with the rod of iron. So having said that, let's just go forward to verse um, 29. And actually, you know, the, the consider that the, that the tribe of Judah is... is because now their march is before all of them. So now, and Moses said to Hobab, the son of Raguel. So wait a minute, is Hobab the the father-in-law of Moses? Here it says that that Hobab is the son of Raguel, the friend of Abraham. Why is he a friend of Abraham? Because he's because of his grand grandfather Abraham. He was taught to be a friend of Abraham, you know. So he taught his house well, uh, basically. And through Keturah, you know, to send the Midianites. So the Midianites, uh, Raguel, the Midianite, was in his, was in his name Jethro. Well, you know, it's establishing here a relationship. The name, the named, he's under the authority. Obviously, he's a friend of God, just like Abraham. He's a Midianite, just like the children of of Abraham with Keturah. He is Hobab. He is loved, beloved. But that's actually the children of Moses. He's kept hidden in the heart, basically. Who know at the heart but him that is the spirit which is within all men. And then he's Moses' father-in-law. So that means that Moses' father is actually Raquel, the friend of God, Abraham. Moses' father is actually um, uh, a Midianite, Keturah and Abraham. Moses' father-in-law is um, uh, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Jethro, his excellency priest of Midian and you know Moses father-in-law according to the law according to the flesh is um who else it's Yatar it's the remnant the 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 leftovers the hanging over so we see a continual like progress concerning the, this fact so now I do again mention that Hobab is code for the you know the lineage that Moses signs over to Jethro. Therefore, in the book of, I think it was Judges, or, or perhaps Joshua, no, Judges, therefore, you know, the Ken, Kenites are counted for, for children of Hobab, father-in-law of Moses. No, they're children, perhaps, of Moses, but signed away through the bill of divorce to Jethro, or to Raquel, or to Reuel, or to priest of Midian, or to the man, or to the priest of Midian, oh, I think I said priest of Midian, or to Jethro, or to the, or, you know, the Midianite, that, all these kind of names, we are journeying to the place of which the Lord said, I will give it you, come thou with us, and we will do thee good, 
and the Lord, for the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. And he said to him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. Now a lot of people think, see, he left. Well, keep reading. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee. When has Moses not received the prayer from the Most High, right? For as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us. So he's trying to, you know. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days. So they departed. They never left. They never, you know, they stuck together. And then we go forward. And it says, you know, it talks about the ark and stuff like that, which can be in turn on connected to Psalm 68, verse 31. Uh, let's see. Should we continue? Yeah, I think we should continue. I mean, might as well wrap this up. So, see, just really briefly, I'm not even going to go into detail concerning this. Chapter 12, the book of Numbers. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. What does this mean? It's There's a redundancy. There's a circle. A circle going on. There is an expression that's being duplicated. Torah does not waste time or word or space with words that are unnecessary. Moses, you know, spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. They were hating on her. Why? Because Hashetan is from within. You know, still to this very day. Why can't we accept Ethiopia? Because we're, we're haters. That's why. And it's got nothing to do with the flesh because Ethiopians are black, right? So what's wrong with, with receiving black people? Aren't don't, don't black lives matter? No, it's just a hater thing. It's, it's just that we hate, we hate, you know, on each other. Um, why her? Why Ethiopians? They were hating on them because Ethiopians got saved first. That's why. We'll go into detail, you know, hopefully during this video. Um, a little bit on the forward. So basically, Josh shuts their mouth up, and it's all like, listen, when I talk to this prophet or something, I'll, I'll talk to him in parables, and dark speeches, and dark sayings, and proverbs. I'll talk to him in dreams. It's not so with Moses. What makes you think that Moses is doing his own will? He's actually doing my will. You wouldn't know that, right? But why don't you fear to speak against my chosen? You think he don't know what he's doing? I tell him what to do. He's faithful to me. You know, I speak to him face to face, clearly, you know, without no parables, nothing. I tell him, what's up? And you are being Hashetan to me. You are trying to stir up the fire. You are trying to stir up and get to Moses to break, utilizing, going in circles, which is unnecessary concerning what I told him to do. Marry an Ethiopian. I actually did it. For that same purpose to stimulate zealous for jealousy within you for you have made me jealous going whoring to other gods see how it feels basically kind of like that anyways um the key word here that is not translated is you'd it's like a stick a stick the which once could brand it's a fire stick it's they were stirring the pot trying to heat up fire trying to accuse the faithful brethren ethiopia trying to brand on moses their wickedness what could we connect with this well the rod it's a it's a staff it's a rod the branch they did not like the branch just like they don't like yeshua hamashiach because we are haters we hate ourselves and there therefore we we are evil to ourselves so basically Let's go to Zechariah real quick, just as quickly as possible. Chapter, I think it was chapter 4. Prophet Zechariah. Chapter, no, chapter 3. And he shewed me Yeshua, Yahshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan, Shaitan, Hashetan, standing at his right, right hand to resist him. And the Lord said to, to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? 
So basically, it's like, okay, Hashetan, okay, Miriam and Dom and Aaron, you've been going around in circles hating the Ethiopians. Now I've tested them. Now I've tried them. Can you say that they have not been through the experience that you have been? No, you can't. So shut up. I've tried them. They're branded. They're mine. They've been, you stirred up the fire. I put them in the pot. They, they burned, but they're still alive. Behold, you know. So, shut up. The same word is used. Have I not branded them? The same word is used. A pointer. Piercing one another. Picking at one another like a thorn in one side. Just trying to instigate problems because you hate him. Trying to stir the pot. You know, trying to fan the fire. Accusing the brain. Why do you marry an Ethiopian? Why do you have to marry an Ethiopian? Why an Ethiopian? Why an Ethiopian? You know? And so Hashetan, by that time, you know, in, in the in the book of Zechariah, it's done. It's like, okay, I've tried the Israelites. I've tried the Ethiopians. Can you shut up now? So that's basically what's coming down. And, um, and then later on, you know, the same chapter goes on to the branch. And then that's when we learn because it's not our righteousness. It's his righteousness and righteousness it's not a personality it's not a character it's a person and how and and the the king of kings of ethiopia alex Lassie, first he chose jesus crystals this is why this is what makes me want to follow jesus christ that's what he said so basically we have to follow jesus christ that's his righteousness that is the cause that is just which his majesty has established to us as head so we completely against this but when we get our acts together then we're like paul and we turn to it so having said all of that that's basically just i mean there's a whole lot more to it but that's just basically like um you know uh real briefly i mean concerning that matter so now the yud you know instead of teaching with one another we decided to pierce and poke at one another so Exodus, you know, there's a reference in our notes concerning the book of Exodus, the throne, the hidden throne. Uh, we've mentioned that. We really don't feel like going to it right now. So we're just going to go to Exodus chapter 2 and watch. This is this will be a little bit um, interesting. Chapter 2, verse 11, the witch reads, you know, Moses identifies himself with Israel, actually. Well, it's not verse 11. I thought I, was, I wanted to speak about that. But he, Moses tried to go to his brethren and do it by force. It's not going to work like that. So then that's why he smites an Egyptian. See, I'm really for the fact that that um, Jah probably revealed himself to Moses. Like when he became, um, when he grew up. When it says that, that you know, um, he grew up and the child grew. That means that he became a man. That, you know, that, that means that he matured. He received a message, so he goes to identify Moses, that is, to his Israelite family. Why? Because he learned something, but he wasn't told to go there. I, I could almost, like, assure everyone, although I have no evidence to establish that fact, I, I base my my um, standing on, on just, like, the patterns of John. You know, he tells you, don't go, to, don't go to your brethren, and we go. So that's, you know, that's kind of like what I'm thinking. And uh, why do I know this? Well, why should Moses have killed anyone unless Jah had to get him out of there somehow? That's usually how it works. Because whatever we're told to do, be sure that we do not do it. You know, so, okay, you want to stick around? They're not going to listen to you. Okay, kill that Egyptian. Now run. Now you got to leave. Now you got no choice. I need you out of there. First, you had to go to the mount and learn some things. Then you could have saved them. You can't save them without leaving Egypt and worshiping me out in the desert and spirit and truth and, and up in the highlands. You know, so that's basically the pattern. I mean, to add to that, when Jah told them, I'm going to send you, you know, to, to go save your brethren. Oh, yeah, whoever you're going to send, send. I said I was going to send you. Now you're just making me angry. So, you know, just to, to add to the fact that we rebellious always from the beginning, don't matter who we're talking about. Anyways, um, going forward, uh, actually what we're looking for is, um, I really don't feel like going into details, oh watch, okay, 
book of Exodus, chapter 2. Verse 23. And it came to pass, in process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of, of the bondage of Boda. And they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. This is what it says in, in, in the Hebrew. It begins with this. It doesn't say like process of time. It says eighth. It says eighth. It's the Hebrew Concordance 1992. It's as to say day two. Ye too, Ethiopian, shall be smite, shall be smitten with my sword. Have we not been smitten with this word? Have we not been cut off, but not completely? Have the Ethiopians been cut off? Cut off? Yeah, kind of. You know, but not completely. So it's what it's referring to. It doesn't say in the process of time. It's because eighth, in a way, there's there's another eighth, the which can be attributed to like a a certain time, a certain date, a certain like an an appointed time. But in this case, it's the H 1992, which is in turn uh, to be interpreted as as they also. So Israel also at their appointed time when the king of, of Egypt died, the children the children of Israel sighed. By reason of the bondage. Why is it saying that they too? Well. Because they too will be saved. By the same one that saved. Who are the other ones? Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians to me? Say it Yahweh. That's the other ones. They too. H1992. Eighth. With the Ain Tau. Are ye not? No. So that you can be. To us instead of eyes, ein, and we will be instead of alet, we will be et, we will be the mouth that testifies, you will be our eyes, and we will be one flesh, and we will have the audiovisual, the double teaching of peace, the Yerushalayim, you know, the, the double teaching, audio video, we will have two. Or more witnesses and we will be one so we need each other now the reason I say that is because who are the other ones that were saved by Moses well you know the Ethiopians and the shepherds came and drove them away but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock Moses to the rescue Later on it says, and he said to his daughters, and where is, no, 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 verse 19, and they, no, verse 18, <laughs> and when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of, of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flocks. And he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that ye left the man? Call him. That he may eat bread, that we can talk about Christ. Let us let us study Torah. Why do you let him go? He saved you from an Egyptian. An Egyptian saved you from from the downpresser. That's no Egyptian. That's prophecy. So that's that's pretty much basically what um what uh you know what I'm kind of tired. I'm just gonna pause. Uh, anyways, this thing's gonna turn off. Perfect time. Shalom.